these are the solutions to recitation activity number two. So we're told here PBI2 and KI are both ionic compounds with much higher boiling points than water, so they're salts. Uh, KI is water soluble, but we're told here PBI2 is insoluble in water. And so how can we separate the two? So imagine the two compounds, we have a solid powder. What we can do is we can add water. The water will dissolve the KI, but leave the PBI2 as a solid. So let's add water, filter the solid from the liquid. The solid from the liquid will be the insoluble PBI2. And then we'll have KI in water. So water boils at a lower temperature. KI has a very high boiling point, so let's just evaporate the water, and then we should be left behind with the KI. So that's how we can separate potassium iodide, or excuse me, uh, lead iodide and potassium iodide here. Would be answer D. Number two, on an analytical balance, or an analytical balance is not properly calibrated, so its masses are always being read a little bit too high. Um, and it's, every measurement is too high by 1.2542 grams. The balance um, is always high by the same amount. So it's going to be very precise still, but just not very accurate. So it's going to continue to be a precise instrument, but not accurate at all. It's going to be off its target. Accuracy relates to the closeness to the true value. Uh, so we're going to be off the true value, but precision relates to the repeatability. The experiment will still be very repeatable. Question three, which corresponds to an inexact quantity containing exactly three significant figures. I count 125 students. This is exact. This is an exact quantity. This would have an infinite number of sig figs, not three sig figs. If you count an object, that number of sig figs is perfect. Um, $100 bill, money. That's exact. You have exactly $100 if you have a $100 bill. So there's an infinite number of sig figs in a $100 bill. If you have one of them, you clearly have one, not two, not zero. Uh, if you have a $100 bill, it's not like, uh, is this $99 or $101? No, that's precisely $100 um, with an infinite number of zeros after it. And then a balance tells you you have a mass of 1.00 grams. This is the one that has three sig figs. So what three sig figs means is you have 100 plus or minus 0 0.01 grams, at least 0 0.01 grams, if not even more. So you have some uncertainty in the last digit all three of the digits, including this uncertain digit. The uncertain digit is the one that you have some uncertainty in. And so we have three sig figs in the 1.00 gram value. How many sig figs are on the result of this arithmetic here? So we just have to apply the addition rule when we add these two numbers here. So let me do that in a calculator, 12.45 plus 7.234. Let's even line this up. So what we're going to do is round to the placeholder that's the highest value. That's the hundredth placeholder. So I'm going to round this to 7.23. Now, here's the thing with numbers or with the math. Like, I might note that this has three sig figs. I could round and then do the next step. Or I can just go ahead and leave the number as it is and just know that it only has three sig figs and then do the next step. Not that big of a deal. If keeping an extra digit is too confusing, just go ahead and round it. This is kind of where lab rights getting into the whole raw versus precise value. When we're carrying out sequential calculations, we don't want to keep rounding and rounding and rounding and eventually have a rounding error, and then our rocket misses Mars. Um, what we might want to do is keep the extra four around for now, but know that it's not a significant number. Only the 7.23, those three digits would be significant. And so then I do the subtraction step. I do 12.45 minus 7.234. And again, the subtraction step should be good to the hundredth placeholder. So we do the subtraction step. So I do 12.45 minus 7.234. I get 5.216. So again, I could round this to 5.22 and do the next step, or I can carry the six for a minute and keep it along for the next calculation where I multiply these two numbers together. Three sig figs times three sig figs should be rounded to, of course, three significant figures. So this question is never even asking for the numerical answer, uh, but if, if it did, it would be just working out. The answer would be 37.7. And just for the sheer curiosity, the units here would be meters still. If for sheer curiosity, 
we had rounded, and let's see if the number actually would be a little bit different. So if I do 7.23 times 5.22, uh, it's still 37.7, but maybe it would have been 37.6 or 37.8 um, if we had rounded and then carried out the next step. Okay, so three sig figs in our result here for question four. Number five, let's convert micrometers to centimeters. How do we do this conversion? So we want to get the number of centimeters, 125 micrometers. I can do one of maybe uh, two things, and I can do the conversions two different ways as well. So let's take a look here. What I might do is I might, might make the conversion between micrometers and meters and say how many meters are in a micrometer or how many micrometers are in a meter. So that's my choice. I could either say how many meters are in one micrometer, and that answer would be, this is really small, so this would be 10 to the minus six. Or I could say how many micrometers, I'm sorry, my, <laughs> how many micrometers are there in one meter? And the answer to this question would be, there's a lot of the micrometer, the small thing in a meter. This would be 10 to the plus six. And so I can either do, 10 to the minus six meters in a micrometer or 10 to the six micrometers in a meter. No matter which one I do, the mass is gonna work out to be the same. So let's do it this way. Let's do 10 to the minus six meter is one micrometer. And then we just need to convert one meter to centimeters, 100 centimeters. Or of course you could say 10 to the minus two meters is a centimeter. So what we're gonna do here is 125 times 10 to the minus six. So I might be typing in this here, and I might just go E minus six, because that's one, two, five, times 10 to the minus six, and then times 100. So that should be one, two, five, E to the minus six. So that's point zero, one, two, five. So if you get a number that's close, be careful not to think, oh, it's just close, I just made a math error. You may have keyed in the math here wrong. It's really important to make sure that we get the basic arithmetic here down pat on this type of question. Okay, on to number six. What is the density in grams per milliliter of an object with a volume 1.95 inches cubed with a mass of 1.25 pounds? Try just to use these particular conversion factors here um, the, uh, hopefully we don't need any other conversion factors or the other ones we need, we should know. So let's see if we can figure this one out. And so what I might do is start this problem the same way we did before, or the same way in general, start with what we're looking for. This is what we're trying to figure out. We'll start with what we're given, um, density mass per unit volume. So I'm going to start with the mass in pounds, 1.25 pounds. And I'm going to divide by the volume, 1.95 inches cubed, and then I'm going to try to get to milliliters. Um, so something I remember not having yet said in class is this conversion factor here. I'm going to probably talk about this on Wednesday, but this is a conversion factor you may have seen before, but this is an exact conversion that a cubic centimeter is a milliliter. So that's how meters relate to liters is through one milliliters a cubic centimeter. And so if we're going to go to milliliters, we might be thinking going to centimeters. And so when I start thinking of this conversion, if I take one inch to 2.54 centimeters, I have to be a little careful here. That I have to cube my entire conversion factor. Why do I have to cube the entire factor? Well, imagine you have a cubic inch. You have one inch by one inch by one inch cubed. Well, this would be 2.54 centimeters by 2.54 centimeters by 2.54 centimeters. Of course, that's going to be 2.54 cubed centimeters cubed in one cubic inch. And so, so one cubic inch is 2.54 cubed centimeters cubed. So I have to cube an entire conversion if I need to cube the conversion factor. So I do this kind of math here. So one cubic inch, 2.54 cubed centimeters cubed. And then I just do the conversion over to um, kilograms and then to grams. And so I do 2.2046 pounds per kilogram. One kilogram is a thousand grams. 
So hopefully we can get this to work out. So we go 1.95, or excuse me, 1.25, divide by 1.95, divide by 2.54 carat 3, divide by 2.2046, and then times 1,000. And so that gives me 17.7 .7 grams per milliliter. So one conversion factor, again, that we haven't quite discussed in class, but a pretty key one, maybe one that you know already. So this might be one that once we talk about it, once you see it in an example like this one, we'll be taking this for granted. That's a conversion factor that we just need to know, but also probably one most of us knew coming in the door. Question seven, uh, who's credited with the discovery of the mass of the electron? And so the discovery of the electron itself was one of the first experiments, or at least one of the first ones we'll talk about in class on Tuesday. J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. So I don't know why I'm circling this because that's not the right answer to the question. J.J. Thompson discovered the electron through the cathode ray tube experiment through generating the electron um, through the, the high voltage energy being applied to a, I believe, piece of zinc. And so high, ener high voltage energy on zinc created a subatomic particle. That particle was deflected with a magnetic field, an electric field. So that way you can tell that this was a particle that had mass and a particle that had a charge, it had a mass to charge ratio. And then by suspending that particle attached to an oil droplet and then using gravity as kind of a guidepost allowed Millikan to discover the mass and the actual charge of the electron. So Millikan's credited with the discovery of the charge and the mass of the electron through the oil drop experiment. So that's the answer to this question. We'll talk about John Dalton for the atomic theory of gases, or not the atomic theory of gases, the atomic theory of matter. Um, so he kind of began proposing in the early 1800s that matter was likely compri comprised of atoms, that atoms were different from each other, different elements, but the different elements, atoms would be um, generally the same as each other. So he had a couple of postulates that we'll talk about uh, Curie, Madame Curie discovered uh, the radioactive pathways of matter. Um, one of those pathways, um, or one of those radioactive uh, particles was the, uh, um, the alpha particle, the alpha ray is a helium nucleus. So the helium nucleus was used to bombard um, atoms through Rutherford's experiment. So Rutherford discovered through bombarding particles with this particle here. He used that to discover the nuclear model of the atom. So we have radioactive pathways, which sadly uh, took the life of uh, Marie Curie at a young age from uh, presumably cancer. I think it was known to be cancer from the radiation that she's exposed to. And then Rutherford uh, discovered the model with a particle from Curie's work. So this is a quick little um, rehashing of those experiments, or kind of in a way, you're going to see this in Tuesday in recitation before we have a chance to really talk about all these experiments. So this question recitation will be kind of a prelude to what we'll talk about more in lecture. So this question is asking how many neutrons an iodine-127 atom contains. Well, this question is getting at the modern uh, atomic theory, is that protons and neutrons reside in the nucleus. They also carry a majority of the mass. The number of protons plus the number of neutrons is what we call the mass number. That's the mass number. The number of protons itself defines the nucleus. So the proton count defines the nucleus. So the number of protons defines the atom. So this is our atomic number. So we can write our symbol. We can look it up in the periodic table. The atomic number on the table is the number of protons. We'd write that as a subscript before the symbol. So for iodine, we look on the periodic table, it's element number 53. 
So its atomic number is 53. And then the mass number is what we write up top. So this is the mass number. So this is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And then the number of protons is 53. So if I subtract 53 from 127, I get 74 protons or 74 neutrons. Now atoms can exist sometimes with a varying count of neutrons. Uh, iodine actually predominantly is just about 100% iodine 127. So iodine happens to exist as just a single what we call isotope. Uh, but some elements exist as, you know, maybe two isotopes, maybe three, maybe four, depending on the element. I think copper is an example of an element that exists um, on Earth as four different isotopes. Carbon's predominantly two, tiny bit of a third. And so the, uh, the, the ratio of those isotopes isn't something you can predict. Those isotopes formed either during the Big Bang or they are being formed by processes that are taking place from larger atoms that are decaying into those atoms or other decay processes that are leading to those given isotopes. So very interesting if you wanted to get deep into the topic of um, how these isotopes interconvert to and from each other um, or by nuclear processes of atoms that are always going on, but generally very slowly. Um, you can check out the nuclear chemistry chapter later if you wanna take a peek at that, but um, maybe that's a topic for other courses. But the big thing here is just understanding the symbol from the periodic table, the atomic number from the periodic table, and then the difference of the mass number and the number of protons to get the neutrons. Now, what about electrons? So our electron count, our protons carry charge, neutrons are neutral. So our electron count in a neutral atom, iodine would have to have as a neutral atom, 53 electrons. So it's 53 negative particles, 53 positive particles. They have the same charge, just opposite in sign. So this question here is asking about the proton and electron count of calcium but with the two plus charge. So our charge is indicated after the um, symbol. We look up calcium on the periodic table. The atomic number of calcium is 20. You always get a periodic table. It always has the atomic number. If for some reason you didn't have the atomic number listed, you're literally counting calcium as the 20th element listed on the periodic, PR, ah, periodic table. And so then the, um, the mass number we're not told here Turns out you don't need to know the mass number for this particular problem because the proton count is equal to 20. And then the um, electrons are spinning outside of the nucleus around the nucleus of the atom. So the electron count can be changed by gaining and losing electrons. Calcium here lost two electrons. So we lost two electrons. How do I know I lost electrons? <laughs> I am writing so terribly. Um, so I have 18 electrons. I would have had 20 if this were a neutral atom. And so in order to have a net positive charge, I had to lose two electrons. So this gives me a net charge of plus two. So if I have more electrons and protons, the atom would have a negative charge. If I have more protons than electrons, then the atom has that net positive charge. So 20 protons, 18 electrons. What about iron with a three plus? Iron's element number 26, so it has 26 protons. Three fewer electrons gives me 23 electrons. Something to kind of go along with the previous example, like maybe that should be an anion. And maybe, you know, in retrospect, I might change that out to be an anion. Let me, um, you know, kind of give a guess. And I'm probably going to pick something like chloride ion and ask how many electrons does this thing have? What does this ion have? Well, chlorine's element number 17, so we have one electron added in, so I have 18 electrons here for chloride. So don't be so surprised if either you see an additional question or um, that previous question replaced with a question like how many electrons does the chloride ion contain? That would be 18. Okay, so what about the charges in Al2O3? Well, the alkali group, the lithium, sodium, potassium group of elements, these all commonly exist, 
exist as plus one charged cations because these all have three, 11, 19, et cetera, electrons where we're well suited to lose one electron from those and come up with the same kind of electrons as our noble gases. What allows the noble gases to exist as monoatomic gases as, as uh, stable atoms is having that filled shell of electrons. We'll talk about electron shells and orbitals and those kinds of things when we get to chapter six later, but that noble gas kind of electrons we can sort of imagine must be especially stable. So atoms that are particularly close to the noble gases, either on the left side, losing electrons, we can get there pretty easily. And so we lose an electron. The electron count here would be two, 10, 18, and this matches the count of helium, neon, and argon, etc. So we're forming plus one cations as the common and really only stable ion for the alkali group. The alkaline group, that's the magnesium group, calcium, strontium, barium, etc. These are well suited, and then the only stable ions these form are two plus ions, because these would have um, the the protons of 12 20 uh, etc i have a periodic table right in front of me so but you could double check the periodic table for these but these are well suited to lose two electrons and come up with that noble gas count of electrons so the alkaline group forms plus two well aluminum is in that category of having 13 protons so we can lose three electrons for it to form that count of electrons to match neon and so magnesiums uh, count of electrons is 10 with a two plus charge and aluminum's count would be a three plus charge to have that same kind of electrons as neon. So aluminum in Al2O3, this is going to be an ionic compound of the common ion of aluminum, three plus cation, and then oxygen, which has atomic number eight, it's two away if it gains electrons. So we gain two electrons. Now we go to 10 electrons, same kind as neon. And so oxide, uh, the oxide ion has a two minus charge. And so what I'm kind of doing here is just trying to make sure that we kind of treat our math here. Al2, like sort of picturing of oxide ion, I have three of them. That's a total minus six charge coming from three oxide ions. Then that's counterbalanced by having three plus times two by having a total of six plus from my two three plus charge cations. So a stable molecule has to be neutral in charge, or at least, you know, a, a compound that has a net charge would be written as an anion. But most compounds, um, if it's going to be something that can exist by itself, would have to be charge neutral, or it have to be paired up with some sort of counter ion, so that overall the charge is neutral. But Al2O3, the idea would be there's no charge indicated here, so this has to be neutral. And so Al2O3 to be neutral, three two minus ions, two, three plus ions. So that's Al2O3. And so the charge of aluminum is three plus. And so that's per aluminum. So we say, what's the charge of aluminum? We need, per, we mean, what is the charge of one of the Al cations in Al2O3? Now, Al2O3 is, you know, I don't know exactly what the structure and the, you know, like how these ions are going to arrange themselves in three dimensions, but we're going to have some kind of case where we have these ions something like this. Where we're going to have two three pluses to every three O2 minuses. The negative charges don't want to touch each other, they repel. The positive charges don't want to touch each other, they repel, but we get the attraction between the plus and the minuses. And then we're just keeping that ratio of three to two. And then the real like ionic compound would probably be a solid where we'd have these ions repeating in charge throughout like an entire structure. So imagine these charges repeating in all three dimensions, left, right, in front of it, and behind it, etc. How do we name compounds? Well, this is an ionic compound. How, how do I know it's an ionic compound? Well, I have a metal and a non-metal together, so I'm going to have a compound where each of those uh, atoms has a charge. And then, so I have a two plus and a minus, and then those charges have that electrostatic force of attraction that opposite charged ions have for each other. We'll talk about lattice energies in chapter eight, a little bit more detail, but I think we can understand or appreciate that plus and minuses have a built-in attraction. Those are ions, so hence this is an ionic compound. Um, I wanna stress identifying things as ionic compounds because ionic compounds have a nomenclature rule 
that their name is just, well, what's the name of this cation? Well, that's just calcium cation. So it's just calcium as the cation. And then chlorine and its negative charge is chloride. Simple ions, if you take a monoatomic atom and just give it its charge, it gives it the noble gas count, um, is going to take that simple IDE ending. So this is calcium chloride. So chloride is Cl minus. Calcium is Ca2 plus. So this compound here just has two chlorides for every one calcium ion. So we don't have to go calcium dichloride because the name calcium chloride is good enough. Because this name here tells us everything we need to know. We, we know calcium can only form a two plus cation. Calcium cannot form a plus charge cation. It cannot form a three plus charge cation. It only forms by placement on the periodic table. From our knowledge of that, it only forms the plus two cation. Chloride only forms the minus. So I'm going to have to have two chlorides for every calcium. So I only need to include information like a dichloride or a trichloride if that's relevant for the compound. If, if we like somehow have two different compounds that could have existed, if we had the case where maybe calcium chloride could exist with just one chloride, that compound doesn't exist. So the only compound between calcium and chlorine as an ionic compound is CaCl2. So hence, we just call that calcium chloride. How many oxygen atoms are present in a sulfate ion? What's its charge? There's a little bit of memorization. We'll be talking about this in class, but some of the things we want to know is that SO42 minus is what we call a molecular cation. It's molecular in a sense that oxygens are connected to um, the sulfur atom, and then that this collection of atoms bears a two minus charge. And so that's what we mean by molecular. It has these molecular covalent bonds, and then anion because it bears a charge. So the number of oxygens is four, the charge is minus two. We'll see that's just something we have to know for sulfate. Uh, we'll also learn a few others. So we'll learn that like carbonate is CO3, two minus, nitrate is NO3 minus, phosphate is PO4, but three minus, there's sulfate. And another common one is ClO3 with a minus one charge. So we'll just kind of have to memorize that these are what we call the most common uh, oxyanion of the given element. So carbon, so carbon eight, nitrate, phosphate, chlorate. So the eights are just the case where we have oxygens directly attached with covalent bonds to a central atom. And then the most common, commonly found in nature uh, compound with the number of O's in the charge, we call that the root name of the element followed by the ATE symbol. Another molecular anion, but with a positive charge is ammonium. So ammonium, it's having four hydrogens connected to a nitrogen, where this overall bears a positive charge. So we can have molecular cations too. These are all hydrogens here. This is ammonium. So the IUM ending is common for a lot of metals. It's common for charged substances with a positive charge. Um, now ammonia, ammonia is NH3 without the charge. So this is ammonia. Ammonia doesn't really come up maybe by nomenclature too much, but I just wanted to kind of show the difference between ammonia and ammonium. Okay, and then lastly for uh, this activity, the last question is, well, what's the formula for barium phosphate? Barium is in that alkaline group with magnesium, calcium, strontium. It forms only the two plus cation as its only stable cation. We just saw PO4 is a three minus. So my ratio here has to be three to two, and then I use parentheses when I have a molecular cation to indicate that I have two of the phosphate ions. And so if I have calcium chloride, I don't need to put parentheses here on the chlorine because you know we just don't need to put parentheses around a single atom. Now, what's really worth kind of picturing though still is that there's just two chloride ions. So when I'm picturing this, hopefully I'm picturing this with two chloride ions perhaps on either side of the two plus, and I have this electrostatic force of attraction. Here in this compound, I'm going to have a molecular cation with a three minus charge, and I'm just gonna have two of them. And so this is the way we express the formula for Ba3PO42. So this is this one here. And then 
one of the things we want to differentiate or say, well, make sure that you see that why is this wrong? We don't go P208 because this is implying that we make a new molecular cation, or excuse me, molecular anion that has a new formula. So we keep the PO4, we keep four oxygens attached to one phosphorus that has a three minus charge. You can imagine maybe we have that on one side of our barium. We have our barium cation here, maybe another barium over here, maybe another barium um, somewhere else, but let's put a phosphate over here. And then maybe there's a barium over here. And so this is just kind of the connection where we're just kind of trying to picture something that looks like BA3PO4. Okay, so that kind of wraps up this activity. This activity has a lot going on that gets a little bit ahead of lecture, but again, you know, we're just trying to uh, use recitation to hopefully, you know, introduce some material and also review some material. And I know it's probably almost always a little bit easier to review material and recitation, but here's the the, the kind of timeline of events is going to be that we get one more recitation for activity three, and then by the next recitation, we're taking midterm one. So we wanna be able next week to kind of push a little bit more into nomenclature, but get into some chapter three topics that also will be getting ahead of lecture. Um, and then, uh, or maybe a little bit ahead of lecture, we'll have to see what our schedule is looking like into uh, the following week. But what we're gonna have to do is um, just make sure that we're using recitation to try to cover as much as we can over the chapters and the material that are going to be on our midterms. So if we always go review, we're gonna lose the last couple of lectures that we cover um, prior to the midterms. All right, so that'll do it for this video. Thanks for your attention and have a great week.